welcome everyone.、Uh, welcome to Fast Star、uh, 2020. We're very excited to be one of the first sections in the conference. My name is Christine Kaiser Chen. I'm from Google Research New York. Here are my co-presenters.、Uh, my name is Trevor Dealy. I'm from the IBM Center for Advanced Studies in Ottawa and the University of Ottawa. And I'm Manny Moss. I'm coming to you from Data and Society and the CUNY Graduate Center in New York City. We also have、uh, collaborators Elizabeth and Frederica who couldn't join us unfortunately. So it'll be three of us today.、Um, so before we started, just want to give a quick acknowledgement. This project was started as an assembly program 2019, which was co-organized by the Harvard Berkman Klein Center and the MIT Media Lab. We also want to give a special shout out to our collaborators Yawanda Alade and Chintang Parma for their significant contribution to our project. Um, this is our project website. In the bottom, there is much more information on that. There's also more case studies,、um, also previous presentations. If you are interested, please go check it out.、Um, so this is going to be a one and a half hour tutorial. I hope all of you are <laughs> excited to join us.、Um, make yourself comfortable. We're going to be here for a while.、Um, just to give everyone a rundown of how it's going to be structured. Um, to start with, we're going to have an introduction session to talk about what positionality is, with a few examples to just help all of us to get in the mode of fast start. And a second part will be about kind of how positionality is embedded or implied or applied in the ML pipelines these days, with a few tools that we're going to propose that can help everyone to see to to kind of diagnose how positionality is embedded in the system you are dealing with. And the last part, we're going to go into a few recommendations and also open it up for open discussion and Q and A. That we hope to have a more hope to just have like a discussion with everyone、uh, that has registered for this tutorial here. So,、uh, without further ado,、um, let's go into the question of what is positionality. Before I answer that question for you,、um, let's look at a few examples to to start with. So this is a tomato on the screen. Um, is this tomato a fruit or vegetable? Okay. If you think it's a fruit, raise your hand. Okay. Okay. If you think it's a vegetable, raise your hand.、Oh, I, I see someone raising their hand twice. So yeah, but Manny, you know the answer. <laughs> it turns out it's not that easy. So if you're a botanist or if you're interested in the the botany science, it's it's a fruit. But if you're a nutritionist, it's by all means a vegetable. And if you're a computer vision researcher, if you have based your understanding of the world based on ImageNet, it's just miscellaneous. Before we kind of brush away this toy example to say, yeah, it's just miscellaneous, let's not forget that one man's miscellany may be another man's prime concern. So it actually turns out that there was a U.S. Supreme Court back in 1893. That just to decide whether tomato is a fruit or vegetable,、um, the history of the case was that、um, um, a fruit stand owner in New York,、um, you know, small business owner, that they actually filed a case to say tomato should be taxed as vegetable when they do sales, and this case got escalated all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, which was then decided yes, for commerce, tomato sales should be categorized as vegetable sales. What this toy example tells us is that whether tomato is a fruit or vegetable really depends on the application scenario. Are you building a classification system for scientific purposes? Are you building it for a botany research, or are you building it for 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 a grocery store, for Whole Foods, or for Amazon? The application scenario of how where the 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 classification of tomato is considered really will decide what whether tomato should be categorized as a fruit or vegetable. Okay, let's look at a more real life example.、Um, we're going to look into ICD, which is International Classification of Disease. This is an internationally shared medical coding scheme that's developed by the World、um, Health Organization. So this、um, coding scheme has been in revision, or has been developed for like over a hundred years ago. Has been revision in the past hundred years, and the most recently ICD-11 just got released. So ICD is this medical coding foundation that allows doctors and、uh, uh, health ministries across the world to categorize disease in the same way. 
So that helped us build an international understanding of disease outbreaks to track disease and also helps patients from one country to get treatment in another country so that doctors can have the same understanding of their history. So ICDs captures conditions all the way from acute diseases to chronic conditions and recently even added mental conditions as well. We're going to look into a very small subset or like kind of just a corner of the ICD. Um, in case you didn't know, there's an ICD code for contact with birds. This documents the illness and conditions that might arise to patients because they got into contact with birds. Just as any taxonomy, this is a tree and you can expand to quite a, a great depth. So not only does it capture contact with parrots, Moscow, chicken, turkey, yeah, so it also documents easy condition arise um, by bitten by parrots, struck by parrots, or other contacts. Is it initial con encounter, subsequent encounter, or something after that? So your first reaction by looking at this, if you're not familiar with ICD, might be, wow, this is quite expensive, comprehensive. I didn't know that there were so many conditions that can be captured by internationally standardized code because of contacting with birds. Your second reaction may be, wow, this is also very specific as well. You know, there's birds from the pets category, there's birds that are farm animals, um, chicken, turkey, they are all farm animals. You may start to think that, okay, I can see the reason why these categories of birds are captured in this tree, this taxonomy tree. But your third, at uh, the third look, you might start to think that, hmm, I wonder why ostrich is not here. You might think that, because we all know that ostrich is much bigger and can be much more dangerous than chicken. Or why is vulture not here, which is also a very big and very dangerous animal in parts of the world. So to answer that question, I have to go back to how ICD was developed. So ICD was first developed in the late 19th century as immigration between US and Europe, or like let's say North America and Europe became much more frequent. So there were contagious diseases being transported across the ocean. So at that time, scientists and doctors from across the continents got together and decided to use, decided to establish an internationally shared coding to document these contagious diseases being transported from one continent to another. But ever since then, from late 19th century till now, we can still see that the perspectives in ICD are mostly European and North America centric. ICD does not have much mention of illness that are commonly encountered in Southeast Asia, for example. And in this very toy case of ICD, you can see that even the Australian perspective, even some of the African perspective or Asian perspective are still not captured in the classification system. Lastly, let's, let's, not, let's, look, let's go back to ImageNet, which has been the benchmarking computer vision data sets for the past 10 years. It has trained, I would say, at least two generations of machine learning scientists and computer vision researchers. ImageNet, based on, ImageNet is, um, is a data set that has images associated with a taxonomy. We normally just call it ImageNet taxonomy. And here's a snapshot of how the taxonomy looks like. You can see that for the white, which is like kind of a under the person category, it further divides into 30 subcategories, and you can just have a look at what this, some of the categories are. So Kate Crawford and her collaborators has released uh, excellent work um, late last year called excavating.ai, I encourage everyone to take a look. And what they found is that there's kind of sorcery that goes into the creation of categories. To create a category or to name things is to divide an almost infinite complex universe into separate phenomena. From the three examples above, I hope it's clear to all of you that relationship between a thing and its label can sometimes be very tricky. And that's what we're going to study today in our, um, tut in our tutorial. To briefly go through the goals for today's tutorial, Manny is going to um, come up and introduce the concept of positionality. And afterwards, we're going to look into how positionality can be embedded in an ML workflow with real life examples of building an ML application. And then we're going to do a few more case studies, try to just get the room uh, to think how positionality can be embedded in real life applications. 
And last but not the least, we're going to discuss stepping stones towards building a more positionality-aware machine learning system. So, up to Manny. Thanks for that introduction, Christine. Um, so, I'm going to talk about what we mean when we talk about positionality. But before I do that, I want to introduce the concept of uh, mechanical objectivity. Um, a lot of the things I'm going to talk about come out of the science and technology studies literature. Um, so I would encourage everybody to feel free to read more into this. I've tried to signal some of the more prominent um, thinkers and authors on these topics. Um, but for in hacking, um, mechanical objectivity is um, a way of thinking about arriving at an outcome in a procedure governed or um, rule based method. It's mechanical in the sense of like stamping out identical widgets rather than hand making each one so that they all have the same kind of, uh, meet the same kind of specifications and be can become interchangeable as part of larger systems. Um, I think mechanical objectivity describes most algorithmic uh, systems quite nicely because it describes a rule, uh, rule governed or uh, repeatable way of making a decision um, through a uniform set of steps. Um, you can think about uh, mechanical objectivity as arriving at replicable outcomes um, through non-machine learning systems like audit and accounting or through sentencing guidelines in the real world. Um, but what I want to suggest with mechanical objectivity is that this form of objectivity is good because it allows decision makers um, to be seen as neutral and objective because they're not uh, operating from their own um, uh, subjective biases. We don't want judges making decisions about antitrust cases based on the stock portfolio they hold. There need to be some sort of guidelines that they follow in order to come up with an objective result. Um, but that mechanical objectivity can also be problematic because it embeds a certain set of perspectives into how those rules are crafted and the outcomes that those, pr those produce. It embeds in procedures a single, often bureaucratic viewpoint. Okay, what is positionality? Positionality is an acknowledgement that how people see the world depends on how they are situated within the world. Their past experiences and their position in the world um, adds up to a worldview that permits certain things as true and excludes other things as false. Each person's positionality is unique and it's always partial. There is no view from nowhere from which absolute truth can be established. Groups of people can come to common understandings about what they see as true, um, but that is also a position knowledge. Positionality acknowledges that there are many ways to divide up the world. The ICD is just one way of dividing up all of the different ways of being ill, right? There might be other ways of dividing it up or conceptualizing the concept of illness. Um, you can see this quite clearly in these different kinds of color wheel. The uh, electromagnetic spectrum is a continuum, um, but the right way of dividing up um, color um, depends very much on your perspective. Are you a painter? Are you a physicist examining electromagnetic radiation? Um, do you speak English? What kind of words do you have to describe different colors? Um, are you in the business of printmaking? Um, or are you building computer screens and you need to have um, certain mathematical representations of color in order to do that kind of engineering? Since there's no straightforward relationship between a thing or a set of things and their labels, um, positionality is what determines, uh, is defined by whoever um, takes an interest or makes use of that thing, whoever uses that system of classification. Positionality um, has deep roots in standpoint theory and epistemology. Um, there's a strong tradition of feminist STS that developed the concept of positionality. Um, and so there are many, there are many, many uh, writers who have uh, worked with and refined this concept and encourage you to take a screenshot of this and, and look up some of these authors. Um, one, one branch of positionality comes from Sandra Harding, um, who developed an idea of strong objectivity, which she contrasts with this kind of um, neutral view from nowhere objectivity. For Sandra Harding, you can get at a stronger, more objective understanding of reality by taking all of the positioned and partial views of the world and combining them to come up with a more complete picture of the world, even if you can never establish an absolute truth. 
um, that will hold for all time, right? There's no capital T truth, but you can get closer to that through strong objectivity. Positionality um, also acknowledges the power of dominant groups to embed their worldview in artifacts and systems. Um, the positionality of these groups gets installed in systems that are then repurposed by others, extending the positionality of that dominant group um, beyond its original context. So you see the people who created ImageNet come, came up with a classification of the different images within that data set. But then, as Christine was saying, generations of computer vision researchers wind up using these categories as the things that they're handed um, to make sense of the world. And sometimes those have a a life that goes beyond their creators and the power of those creators then gets extended to subsequent applications. Um, you see this in, uh, not just in ImageNet, but you see it in all sorts of data sets. You see it in the way standards are agreed to and the kind of ontologies we have for making sense of categories. Um, and these get embedded in machine learning in various ways um, that we'll discuss uh, subsequently. Um, <clears throat> so the way, the way that these um, ontologies are built in um, kind of have, they get sedimented into the informational architecture that we have. We see it in ImageNet, we see it in all sorts of database systems, we see it in the different kinds of engineering that links these kinds of systems together. Um, we have legacy information architecture that, that determines how, uh, how we divide up the world, um, how we understand and make sense of the world. Um, one example of this um, beyond ImageNet is the U.S. Census. This is a uh, chart of the different ways, the different categories that were used for race um, from one census to the next, all the way from 1790 um, to, to the 2010 census. And so what you see in this is that the interest of dominant groups to um, count how, ma how many members there are of min minority groups um, gets built into the census, but you also see the result of struggles by minority groups for representation and to be counted as members of that group um, find their way into the census as well. Um, and this is, of course, a double-edged sword. Like in the, uh, as we're seeing in the 2020 census in the United States, the idea of counting immigration status um, is not an unalloyed good for people who have uh, ambiguous immigration status and may not want to be counted as such. Um, so to sum up this, this very, very brief introduction to positionality and bias, um, positionality is not optional. There's no view from nowhere. Um, and positionality encourages us to ask, um, particularly for the Fat Star Conference, what it might mean to remove bias, remove bias according to whom, um, what does it mean for things to appear um, as unbiased, for them to appear as natural or given, and to always ask who makes these decisions and what kind of agency people have for asking why those decisions were made. <clears throat> um, so this was my very brief introduction. Um, we're now going to do a group activity um, to kind of think through some of these in, with our bodies. So um, we're going to do an activity called spectrogram. I'm going to move to a handheld microphone. Can you guys still hear me? You can. Um, what I'm going to ask everybody to do in a minute, not yet, is to stand up and move to that side of the room along that wall. And that wall is going to be the x-axis of our spectrogram. I'm going to then, once we're all over there, um, make an assertion. And if you agree with that assertion, you will move all the way to that. If, depending on how strongly you agree with that assertion, you will move towards that end of the room. If you disagree with that assertion, you will move all the way to this end of the room. Yes? So is the zero, zero point like right there? Yes. <laughs> or the origin is uh, next to you. Um, in the green hair, um, but she might move, but that doesn't mean that the origin is going to move, okay? For now, that's, for, that's where zero is zero. For now, that's where the origin is. There's no negative axis. There is agree and disagree. You can think about that as positive or negative. Negative like numerical value on the, on the y-axis, remember that, right? There's no y-axis, okay. yeah. <laughs> I'm just checking. No, no, that's, that, that's a good question. It, it, it is like the electromagnetic spectrum. So there is only one axis, and there's only wavelength, um, or, or uh, frequency. Um, OK, so we know where the x-axis is. We know where the origin is. We know that if you agree with the assertion, you're going to go to that wall. 
If you disagree, you're going to go to that wall. And if you are completely ambivalent, you remain at origin. And you can sort yourself anywhere along that, depending on how strongly you agree or disagree with that assertion. Are we ready? OK, let's get up and move to that side of the wall. And yeah, I think I th if it's too crowded, we can feel free to make, se make use of this central aisle. I'll stand all the way over here. Uh, but try I'm going to use this, the projector, so try not to block that, OK? All right, this is a, a test case. Wow, there are a lot of people in this room. Um, OK, I'm going to make an assertion. Agree, disagree. On a very long flight, the window seat is the best seat. Agree? Disagree? <laughs> if, if you will refuse to sit anywhere but a window seat, I want your back right up against that wall. <laughs> All right, great. So we have a very different, very, uh, we have a good distribution of opinions here. Um, can I ask somebody who disagrees with this why they disagree with this assertion? Yeah. The longer the flight is, the more often you have to go to the bathroom. Yes. And if you're sitting in the window seat, you're going to be too polite to ask multiple times to go, and then you're going to be uncomfortable <laughs> the whole time. I myself have <laughs> suffered in silence on many a long flight because I prefer the window seat, but I still prefer it. Um, I totally take your point. So you prefer an aisle seat, I would imagine. Um, somebody who has their back against this wall, why did you sort yourself over there? Anyone? <laughs> Beverage card, crucial, crucial. Does anybody, does anybody prefer the middle seat? <laughs> Good, we're all, we're, we are all sane individuals. That's fantastic. Um, all right, so the next case, next prompt. Um, it, if you could try not to block the projector. A um, little, bit, little bit harder. This is a sandwich. Agree against the, the whitish wall, disagree against the darkish wall. Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I should say, if like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep asking why. And if somebody says something that persuades you, feel free to shift your position in the room um, as you're persuaded. Don't play games with me. All right. I, I, see, I see a lot more people sorting in the middle here. <laughs> we, have, we have a small but passionate group of agreements. <laughs> Why? Uh, I mean, so I think there's two kind of axes. Mm -hmm. Whoa. <laughs> 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 so, 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 so depending on like how how you um, I interact with the categories um, depends on whether or not. I see some people who will not make an assertion here or um, are very sorted um, ambivalently. Why are you in the middle? Somebody who's in the middle. Yeah. I've never eaten this thing before. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there, <there's> good, good. <laughs> when you, if you ever come to New York, we'll go out, we'll grab one. Be better than any food. That, that one happens to be a meat-based uh, hot dog, but there are, there are vegetarian options okay. available now. There are impossible <laughs> hot dogs. Um, I think it's pretty obvious why people are over on this wall, but does somebody want to <laughs> tell me why? Anybody? Oh. What about? I got a minute. What about peanut butter and jelly? I said cheese or cheese substitute. What about peanut butter and jelly? Oh. Divided the room. 
Uh, okay. Wow. Okay, before this breaks out into fisticuffs, let's move on. This image contains all of the numerals. Agree? Oh, wow, disagree. Doesn't that require me? You feel free to step up and inspect, but it, it's it's MNIST, basically. I said numerals, but you can interpret that how you like. It's kind of the All right, there's there's slightly fewer agrees right now. Can can somebody who has their is over by the whitish wall say why? I'm sorry? So you, so you disagree then with this assertion that this is all of them? <laughs> yeah? I think I agree because there's simply representation of all the numerals for creating things. Uh -huh. Therefore, it represents all the numerals, and then there's not every possible like, way to represent the numerals. Each numeral is represented. That, that, is, that might be persuasive. Mike, uh, do, you have a, do you have a counterpoint? I think some, some aliens may live in base 12 or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if they're, if they're born with 12. That live on Earth. Didn't, that wasn't part of the statement. Well, I mean. <laughs> the, <laughs> Mayan speaking yeah. people uh, use a base 20. So that might, that might apply to Michael's point. Uh, 60 and the, like the clock is base 60 and 24 and, uh, and I don't know. And a lot of clocks have X's and I's on there, and I don't see any X's or I's on there, so Roman numerals aren't included as well. Uh, so based on how we, I'm trying to make a point about positionality, based on like our experience with numbers, if we don't live in the Roman Empire, we might um, be more inclined to see um, these as the exhaustive set of numerals. Okay, thanks for playing along. Um, this is a pipe. Agree or disagree? <laughs> My assertion is this is a pipe. Okay, not what it says. <laughs> I don't speak French. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I agree with what it says. Okay, I'm gonna go to the disagree side first. Why do you disagree? Because it's an image of a pipe. Ooh. <laughs> Category error, right. Um, so, uh, do, do people disagree for other reasons as well? What does it say in French? It says this is not a pipe. It's like, I think, it's, yeah, in the spirit of like, you know, the artist. <laughs> great, great. I mean, it says this is not a pipe. Um, some people are not willing to go so, go so far um, as to say it is or isn't a pipe. Why are some of you in the middle? Yes. Uh, anybody, I can't quite see, but is there anybody who's, yeah, that's a pipe. I've seen Sherlock Holmes movies. He's smoking one of those pipes. Anyone agree? It's a representation of a pipe. Cool. Therefore, it is a pipe. Yeah, all right, fair. There's enough pipes on the paper to smoke tobacco with, and I refuse to smoke tobacco with. The map on the left is more accurate than the map on the right. Uh, my, uh, I'm facing it, you're facing it left. You're trapped. You're trapped. I'm, I'm trapped. But I'm, I'm stuck here. I'm like, it's just like, there's this open hole for us. I can't do it. Fuck it. All right, so. Nobody think, am I correct in thinking that nobody agrees that the map on the left is more accurate? I think so, okay. It depends what it's for. Let's hold on to that. Why do some people agree that the map, on, or disagree that the map on the left is more accurate? Because they're both distortions. All right, it's impossible to have a best. Uh, I mean, I, I tend to think of the fuller projection as the most accurate. 
Uh, neither, of these, neither, yeah. neither of these are. I prefer the purse quinconceal projection <laughs> myself. Uh, but we have we have a Mercator projection and a Peters projection. Um, why are some of the people in the middle? And then I'll I'll reveal. Not a having bit. enough information. Okay, not having enough information. Any other? Any other? Yeah. Fear cannot be accurately matched. Yeah. But what about what about there are degrees of accuracy? Would, would yeah. you not agree? So so one could be more accurate. I have no but, idea. Okay. So it, it turns out these, these maps are about as accurate as each other. Yes. Um, <laughs> two points to Gryffindor. Uh, <laughs> the map on the left is, um, very, is not very good at depicting area across the globe from north to south, but it is very good at depicting direction from one point to another all the way across the map. The map on the right is very good at depicting area, but not as good at depicting direction. Okay. I think we have one more. The circle on the right is bigger than the circle on the left. Agree, disagree. Which, which circle? The, the red circle on the right. Um, the central circle, if you're colorblind. People become more suspicious. They get first we're like, oh, I have to um, no. So people on the disagree. Why are why are we disagreeing? It's an optical illusion. People in the center. Why are we disagreeing? Okay. <laughs> okay, so we're we're definitely parsing the question here, and that's totally fine. What's that? That's right. Um, so if if you had never seen an, this optical illusion before, or didn't know that such things as optical illusions existed, might your might your answer be different? Okay, maybe I should have asked. The circle on the right appears bigger, but um, mm -hmm. they are they are the same size. It is an optical illusion. Um, ways of perceiving, habits of perceiving, um, tend to trick us into seeing the circle on the central circle on the right as bigger. Um, is that the last one? Yeah, that is the last one. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our eyes are now open. <laughs> 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 that was fun. All right, thank you so much for indulging me in bossing everybody around um, and getting people to move back and forth, which is like all I, all I live to do. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Trevor now to, uh, put, to show how some of these ideas um, apply in practice. Great, thanks so much, Manny, and thanks for that uh, exercise. A couple of facts about me. The Number one, I do, I'm doing my PhD with Elizabeth, who is one of our co-presenters. Number two, I told my mom that I was presenting at this conference today and she was pretty impressed. So that was good. Uh, I told her I was a little bit nervous, though, and she said if I confess something embarrassing to you, it might make you like me a bit more. Uh, so the embarrassing thing that I'm going to confess is that I would describe myself as like a medium uh, machine learning practitioner, like not great, but not awful either, kind of like really average. And so I'm always afraid that I'm going to make some sort of terrible mistake, that everything's going to go wrong. So. Uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about positionality and machine learning. <laughs> and I'm going to walk you through a project Elizabeth and I worked on and how we tried to incorporate elements of positionality. I'm going to show you some things and maybe you'll be like, oh, that was really thoughtful and nice. Or you might think like, no, no, you messed it up there, Trevor. You, you really are a medium machine learner. But let's open those up and let's talk about that because that's why we're here today. Um, so the first thing I'd like to do is show you a generalized workflow. This is kind of my own workflow in machine learning. And if you just take a moment and look at this, and based on the activities today, if you've worked with machine learning systems, try to think of places where you think positionality may enter in, you know, this idea of things. Just keep, keep those in mind as, as we're, we're reflecting through those, because I'm going to give you a narrow example from my own research, but hopefully we can kind of build on that towards the discussion at the end. Okay, so most of what I, Elizabeth and I work on are studying incivility on Twitter. And so this is public figures who get really mean things tweeted at them uh, a lot. 
And so some of the, the case studies that are came out last year that I'd like to centralize around for this part is Delisle et al., who was with a group called Troll Patrol. They got a lot of media coverage. It's a really big, interesting project where they were following women MPs in the UK, and the results unsurprisingly showed that uh, women MPs and especially women of color MPs got a lot of uh, mean things said to them online. Greenwood and others uh, have been following the abuse of all UK MPs since about 2015. And what's really interesting is in, in Greenwood's article, they actually kind of get sassy with Delisle and others because the Troll Patrol group got a lot of media coverage. And so Greenwood was saying that they s saw that as interpreting that Delisle was claiming that women get more abuse online than men. And then it turned into this weird like uh, war of the genders kind of thing. And then Greenwood did a study basically trying to show that men got more abuse online than women. And so now we're, we're trying to navigate this complex space because a lot of these outcomes are dependent on how people are defining variables and how they're using certain tools to qualify what counts as abuse. And so positionality is a very central issue to try to be explicit about uh, for these things. So like I said, we're trying to use machine learning tools to classify abuse. So basically you get examples, you train a model, and then you try to get a, a good measure of all the tweets because there's millions of tweets and you're trying to get um, just a number. How much abuse did people get this election online? In the other examples we looked at, again, think about positionality. Delisle and others crowdsourced their questions. So they'd send you a piece of content like a tweet and they would ask a volunteer that was associated with Amnesty International, um, is this content problematic or abusive? And the volunteers could respond with no, uh, yes, it's problematic, or yes, it's abusive. And they coded a lot of tweets this way. They ended up doing about 127,000, which is a very large training set. Uh, Greenwood used a dictionary approach, so they had 388 abusive terms and phrases in uh, UK and US English, and they basically just string match tweets. So if these phrases were contained in a tweet, they classified it as abusive. And so when we think about positionality and how people are defining abuse, I think some of the earlier examples apply here. The Delisle uh, method, it's a bit like is this a tomato, a fruit, or a vegetable? So people might define problematic or abusive or not abusive very differently based on their life experiences. And so it may not be a very specific way to solve the problem you're trying to work on, which I think in this case is hopefully that people get less abuse online. And the Greenwood example, who gets to decide the terms within the dictionary that count as abuse? And what is the context around a term in a dictionary? Manny gave me this example of a great white shark. You know, if you're at a beach and someone yells, that's a great white shark. That's a very specific context. Whereas if I'm in like my art class and my mom says, Trevor, that's a great white shark. I'm like, thanks mom, I worked really hard on it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's different context. One is terror and one is like feeling pretty good about yourself. <laughs> Don't tell my mom I use her in my jokes. <laughs> okay, so going back to this label, we can see that um, a lot of this is in choosing classes, so what counts as abuse. A lot of it is in what people call establishing ground truth data. So when you send those classes out to your labelers, what they think they're supposed to be labeling, how much discretion they have in deciding those labels. So questions of positionality enter into this uh, at, in so many different ways at each point, almost infinitely at each box. It's almost like the box isn't actually a stable thing at all. It's like it, maybe it doesn't even exist, I don't know. And of course, labeling it. And you can see how it impacts the, the, the rest of the, the workflow. And so these are some of the steps that we took. Again, it's not a perfect thing, but we did get some interesting findings from it. And so the, the portion of the tutorial here is to try to walk you through a really step-by-step -step detailed example of how we tried to incorporate these principles and how it worked and how it didn't. Um, so for example, instead of just deciding a coding schedule, we went and we interviewed MPs, their staff that deal with their social media accounts, and we interviewed journalists and et cetera, and we would show them uh, tweets that they had gotten that we thought were pretty mean, um, and say, what, what do you think about this? Like, how does this affect your day-to-day? -day? How does this affect your job? 
And interestingly enough, a lot of the stuff that you might just say, oh yeah, that's off of the book. Oh, no, I don't really care about that. But some other subtler things that came out were like, oh, I hate getting stuff like that. That really ruins my day. All kinds of stuff like that. So we allowed their, the experiences of the people affected by the problem to inform our coding schedule, which was, we, it was super counterintuitive, the things we learned from that, which was awesome. And so we actually didn't code directly for abuse or problematic or harassment at all. We just tried to scale uh, the intensity of negativity was kind of the best proxy that we took from um, the journalist because what might be perceived as a very negative tweet might not actually impact a journalist uh, or they might not take it as ab abusive necessarily. They might say, oh, well, I get stuff like that all the time. It doesn't bother me. Some journalists said that, um, which is unfortunate, but th we're trying to reflect their perspective in the coding. So we can now code for the intensity of negativity without classifying it as necessarily abusive because that would depend on the journalist uh, perspective in our mind. And so then we, we also um, coded for a lot of different types of harassment within it. Um, and then we also focused on this aspect of, instead of just classifying general incivility in a piece of text, it was whether or not it was targeted at an individual. And so, for example, uh, one of the interesting ones was the Conservative Party leader in Canada, Andrew Scheer, would tweet something like, uh, Happy Eid Mubarak to all my Muslim friends. And that tweet was used as a target in the replies as a lot of anti-Muslim sentiment that was classified as uncivil by a lot of leading algorithms, but wasn't directed at Andrew Scheer. And so if you just took those results at face value, you might say, wow, Andrew Scheer took a lot of abuse in that election, when in reality, um, they weren't directed at him. So trying to differentiate those cases was really important. So again, not perfect solutions here, um, but we're trying to keep context attached, specifically the context that we got from our interviews as much as possible. I know it's some, it, you can't do it all the way, but we're trying to do that. And that's by informing our coding schedule with the experience of stakeholders and not specifically designing our model for generalizability. So we're not gonna say, this is a, a out of the box model you can use to classify abuse from tweets. It's like, no, this was a model developed for the 2015 election and here are all the conditions that were put into it and, and all the training. And so once the coding schedule uh, was, was begun, uh, sorry, I'm just bringing this back in uh, to, again, ha try to reintroduce the idea that we see positionality entering in with questions everywhere at the step. Well, how come this was excluded? How come that was included? Um, uh, yes, go ahead. <laughs> That's such a good question, yeah. Uh, that happened all the time, yeah. And so uh, the next slide might help answer that a little bit. Um, and that's obviously one of the failings of studies like this and trying to build machine learning cases, especially with supervised models, is in our case, you have to give the model one label for a case. And it's like obviously that one label doesn't capture all the uh, deliberation around what that means. So there, there's just inherent flaws, yeah. A great question. So we, we, we recruited RAs um, that were with us for the long term so they could, we didn't use like Mechanical Turk or anything like that uh, just because one aspect we really wanted to capture your, uh, your question is the RAs were able to code things and then deliberate the labeling. And so say, well, why did you disagree on this one? What were the reasons why you coded it one way versus the other? And in the deliberation, we could take measurements of agreement before and after and sort of capture the certainty of labels in, in that regard. And at least with uh, deliberation, we can kind of minimize the tomato problem because through the deliberation process of RAs, we can at least give an account for why we chose a label. It's like, so why this label here? It's like, well, we discussed it and these were the reasons we gave in our discussion and here's why we came to that conclusion and you can criticize all of that if you want, um, but that's the process we went through. That's kind of why we, we did the de deliberation step. So we used the label data as training targets and then in order to, partially in order to remain consistent with previous work that uses a lot of Google's perspective API for this kind of work, we generated features from perspective and then we introduced a new feature set from uh, Watson's natural understanding API, which codes text for anger, fear, 
joy, disgust, sadness, sentiment, and then targeted versions of these. So you can give it an entity label, for example, the handle of a politician, and it'll look for that handle in a body of text and calculate the specific emotions towards that handle. So directed anger, directed fear, directed disgust. And we used perspective because we wanted to compare to previous work where people use that as a feature. And we used IBM because we wanted to capture or try to uh, the distinction between targeted abuse and general incivility, like the Andrew Shear example I gave you. So we're trying to see if when you give it a specific target, if it improves classifying those distinctions. This is just repetition. I'm trying to hypnotize you at this point. Um, but no, you, you can see, again, so now we're getting further down into the process. So we have our training data uh, potentially labeled. We're generating features. So obviously there are issues with both the perspective and the IBM features. Like for example, who decides what anger means and how to code that. And so there's like endless layers of complexity here that make any attempt um, more and more problematic in that sense. But then again, it's like you're always trying to patch up holes in a sinking ship is the way I think about it. Um, just to do a little bit better than, than the last attempt, I guess. Uh, so this would be like the feature discovery step, I suppose. Uh, and this was interesting. So what we did was a feature analysis to see how our features were now correlating with the labels. The labels, again, hopefully being more informed of context from the interviews. So along the left axis, you can see the label set. So high negativity, this is just for the negativity question. High negativity, medium, and low negativity, neutral, positive, and unclear. And then along the bottom are some of the uh, features that we were investigating. And so previous issues with this kind of work is a lot of models have trouble classifying positive tweets when you're looking for negativity. And so one of the fun things we found was we were actually pretty good at finding positive tweets. Um, and there's a, a group called ParityBot who is trying to investigate tweeting positive things in response to negativity that uh, women candidates receive. And so there is some interest in this kind of thing. So you can see uh, this feature candidate joy too. So that was when we used the target you in the, the entity category. So a lot of tweet structures will go um, Twitter handle, you are awesome. You are the best. Um, you are a hot dog. I don't know, I, I don't tweet very often. <laughs> and so it's investigating the, the times you were used for the targeted joy and things like that. Uh, the candidate joy number one is when the handle is used as the entity target. And you can see that both of those correlate with the positive label, which is cool. And then in the negative labels, you can see again, um, certain targeted labels do correlate well. So if we look at disgust, see that it has relatively higher correlations for the medium and low. Uh, anger towards the candidate, it co correlates well enough for the high label and for the medium label. Um, sadness as well. And then you can see uh, disgust is another one. And the, these are the U targets the, over here where, where the U entity was used. And then you can see as well that Google's features correlate very well with the a lot of the higher and medium and low. So perspective is quite good at finding the really awful stuff. Um, and so I show you this because to me, when I produced this, I was like, well, maybe we're getting somewhere with this. Maybe we're, from what we heard from journalists in our own investigations, maybe we're moving closer to being able to differentiate that problem of someone just receiving a lot of incivility in their tweets and that getting miscategorized as so-and-so gets a lot of abuse versus now we can differentiate between when people are just being really awful and when they're being really awful towards a certain person. And so this is getting into the more complicated layers of this. So for example, um, in model assessment or interpreting your results, if you've decided that anything over a certain number from perspective is gonna count as abuse, the interpretation of those results might lead you to as we discussed before, erroneously conclude that someone like Andrew Shear was getting a lot of abuse when it was just a lot of incivility. And so um, a lot of what we're showing here is the technical perspective of this side of things, but there are obviously many, many layers on top of it that need to be considered. Um, the last 
two things are some of the interesting findings. So compared to other research teams, when we introduce these new targeted aspects, our F scores improve. So we actually become better at categorizing uh, tweets this way. So Delisle and all had a 0.43 with uh, perspective as the feature. Greenwood had a 0.52 in a dictionary approach and our current average score, it's still early days for the project. It's only been running about two or three months. But we're getting 0.58 and that's with very conservative parameters. Uh, so it, f to me it says, okay, we've tried our best to incorporate these elements and we're still seeing technical improvements. So it's not like a trade-off that you can try to aim for both of them. And we also think we're capturing a broader range of abuse. So a lot of the interviews told us that the things that really um, ruin a journalist's day are things like, like sly condescension. You know, like these really like subtle trolling maneuvers that change so quickly and they're often not easily capturable by, by uh, dictionary-based terms or even existing models out there. So for example, one of the most common things that uh, women journalists reported in interviews was things like, oh, you poor little thing. People might say that to an article, not even dealing with the content or the policy, and they're like, that really just ticks me off. Um, and so it's not the super awful stuff, but then trying to account for that is, is really difficult in, in classification problems. So again, now I think we're totally off this, this diagram now. So you can see that these complications that positionality brings in they, they obviously extend way beyond any diagram of just the technical aspects of making a machine learning model. So there's multiple layers to consider even above the ones that we tried to in our model. It's always a continual process. And so one of the ways to do that is I'm gonna pass it back to Manny and he's gonna talk about some of the perspectives that extend beyond just this technical realm. But the goal of this portion of the tutorial was just to show you uh, as best as possible a very detailed example of how positionality as a concept can be applied within uh, building a machine learning model. Obviously not perfect, obviously still a lot of mistakes, a lot of work to do, but um, small drops in the bucket. Okay. And that, sorry, that was just the findings that we already discussed about difference between targets and uh, general instability. So with that, I'll pass it back to Manny. Thank you so much. Uh, I'll take questions at the end if that's okay. Just a clarification on what oh, sure, yeah. Was. So in the task, the label was predicting the level of negativity and not abuse and civility, right? Uh, targeted negativity. Sorry, I should have clarified that. So we use targeted negativity as a specific uh, training um, label. So it was towards the candidate, yeah. Right. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Thanks, Trevor. So, yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, and great transition. We're going to try and present a way that um, we can start thinking about what happens on that flowchart and on flowcharts like the one that, that Trevor kept referring to and, and to see things that go beyond what's contained in, say, the training and deployment of a supervised machine learning model. Um, Frederica, one of our... Uh, co-presenters who couldn't be here today. And I have spent a lot of time thinking about how to see all of the positionality related issues um, that come up in machine learning um, in ways that can be kind of codified um, so that it can be in inserted into a deployable regular process. Um, and one of the things that we came up with is a set of three perspectives um, to shift between when thinking about how a machine learning model or an algorithmic system or really any technical system works in the world. Um, and we came up with uh, three, per th <coughs> pardon me, three perspectives. Uh, a technical perspective that attends to the data and models very much in the world of the flowchart that Trevor was referring to. Uh, a systems perspective that sees different technical components as being interconnected um, for a use case and deployed in the world. Um, and a socio-technical perspective that takes into account um, the whole world that a system is deployed in and how that might change over time and from place to place and for differently positioned actors within the world. 
So the technical perspective is oriented towards self-contained technological objects that have fairly well-defined and comprehensively described or comprehensively describable inputs and outputs. Um, the parameters in which they operate are usually designed by a small group of people or a single organization with a clear goal in mind. Um, this perspective pays attention to how the technological object transforms inputs into outputs, um, why it does so in one way and not in others, um, and the conditions under which it operates uh, predictably. This perspective also may consider how technological objects are intended to be used or characteristics about those objects' users, um, but it doesn't always do so. The technical perspective draws attention to these things like inputs and outputs. Um, it thinks about or lets us see ways that um, design requirements or parameters might be changed in order to alter the outputs of a technical system or a technical object. Um, it usually focuses on the discrete team of people that is making decisions about this, um, but subsequent perspe the subsequent pers perspectives I discuss will kind of open the aperture of what constitutes a team of people. Um, it pri prioritizes the way we think about building things that are predictable and portable, or scalable might be another word that we could insert here. Um, and the technical perspective tends to treat data and model um, as a closed system. In applying this perspective, each of these perspectives, each perspective attunes us to a set of critical questions. Um, more could be asked than what I list here, but I'm gonna list some of them. Um, the technical perspective uh, encourages us to ask, how do we choose an appropriate trade-off between mutually exclusive options? Um, trade, uh, fairness and accuracy have been framed as mutually exclusive uh, trade-offs that have to be made in, the, in FairML. Um, what alternate trade-offs might there be, might be made? Um, how representative of real-world phenomena is this training data set? Um, are we in a world where like tomatoes matter um, or do tomatoes not so much matter for this, for this world? Um, who is deciding representativeness? Um, does, does it include um, all of the different uh, census categories that you might have? Does it not? How might this uh, technical system look different um, from different perspectives? Um, and how do evaluative metrics obscure performance problems? Um, are, we, are we looking at the right measures of performance? Are we standing in the right position to see that accuracy matters more than recall in this case? Should, be we, should we be thinking about other kinds of metrics um, in terms of what we can measure about a technical object? Often these questions can only be answered by uh, adopting other perspectives that I'm going to present here. The systems perspective is oriented towards m how multiple technological or non-technological -technolo objects uh, interact with each other. Um, the ways these various components interact uh, with each other requires work, uh, and maintaining these interactions re requires even more work as components upgrade, change, and degrade. The systems perspective pays attention to how its various components are deliberately guided towards an outcome, by whom, and for what purposes. Um, the systems perspective sees data as produced by other systems. There is no raw data out there in the world. It is a consequence of other decisions that are made about what to record. The fact that we have phones that will tell us about telemetry um, determines what kind of data is available to us as we like interpret device, like how devices move throughout the world. Um, the systems perspective looks for the work that is needed to hold systems together. Um, and, it, and what really matters for this perspective is often outside of the data. Um, what kind of consequences it have, has on the world um, is what we're really looking for, not just a simple like signal about whether or not our predictions are uh, confirmed or falsified. When we're looking at system, uh, through the system's perspective, we're prompted to ask, what is the goal of the system? Do different components have different goals? Are they working at cross purposes? If I'm using census data for another purpose, is my purpose contraindicated by, like, by understanding how and why the census data was collected? Um, how does the system create feedback effects on the available data? By virtue of the fact that I'm operating within a system, is it magnifying the effects of what is within the system? Um, what are the boundaries of that system? Who does it bring in? 
who is excluded from it? Um, what distinction does it create between those, are in, who, those who are inside and those who are outside? There have been numerous case studies about um, how various, uh, variously positioned people are able to um, benefit from maintaining outside of the system. I'm thinking of the uh, Allegheny family screening tool here that Virginia uh, Eubanks talked about in Automated Inequality, where people who are capable of providing their own, uh, procuring their own mental health services are able to remain outside of a system um, that would otherwise indicate that they might be at a risk, at, that their children might be at risk of harm. Um, and so wealthy people are a little bit less likely to receive an intervention from the county um, in terms of their children's safety. Um, also, what does the system appear to be doing from different positions within the system? Uh, again, looking at the Allegheny Family Screening Tool, um, the county might be looking to conserve resources, um, but people who are relying on those city's services might be um, thinking that the system is there to ensure safety for their children. And those might be, those may or may not be at cross purposes. The socio-technical perspective is oriented towards understanding society and technology as being co-constitutive. Co Technological systems depend in many ways on users following social norms to function properly, and society depends on technological systems to mediate relations between people and between people and objects. The socio-technical perspective pays attention to how different configurations of people and technology shape and reshape, how people think about themselves and the groups they identify with, how categories shift in content and meaning, and how social practices shape and reshape the function and effects of technological systems. So we can think about these large clusters of position, positional experience, race, class, gender, as having very strong effects on how society and technological systems work together. So the socio-technical perspective sees systems as co-produced. Um, technical systems alter social relations. Social relations have weird effects on how technical systems work, often um, surprising th their designers. Um, the socio-technical perspective highlights the changing nature of seemingly stable categories. What happens to a concept of maleness or femaleness when it's embedded inside of a system that's making decisions about people, um, right? What is the effect of having these kinds of binary categories uh, make decisions about people who don't uh, see themselves as fitting within those, those prescribed uh, binary categories? Um, the socio-technical perspective reveals perspectives, interests, and power relations that are baked into data. We see that a little bit with the way the census categories have changed. Um, and we see that the uh, creation of data is often the result uh, or the consequence of a set of irre irreversible choices that were made at some point in the past. Like we inherit a lot of the categorization systems that we have. We see this in the ICD, which has been constantly updated, but it hasn't been radically changed in the main um, like trunks of branching categories that it deploys. Um, it also indicates that unbiasing data is not a realistic option. There's always some sort of positional bias that decides what kind of um, categories we're collecting data within. Socio-technical perspective also sees scale as a variable that alters the fit between data and context. I think um, Trevor's Twitter example shows this. Um, when you're looking at 140,000 tweets, um, the fitness between categories is very different than when you ask how one journalist might react to being um, diminished uh, by a single tweet. So the critical questions, yeah. I would, I, I would say that that often happens, and like there's there's a an impulse to say, okay, these these categories don't fit. Maybe binaries don't apply here. Um, we need more categories, but then that that kind of uh, multiplies the problem in a lot of cases. And the, the problem might be with like drawing lines across continuum. In some cases, that might not match the example that I ex yeah, I suggested. Has a, like a color spectrum. Uh huh. Sure. Um, but it's not that there's like eight colors and then different eight colors. There could be, there could, I mean, that could be one way of reconfiguring it. You could say that there are eight colors here and I there are different eight. Do we actually see that? Do we actually see like a change in categories or do we see more categories and categories? Which does create a little bit of a change, right? Sure. Because 
sure. But the reaction is to like unstable. So yes, and yes, I think I think we do see categories change. But I think I think what I'm what I'm trying to gesture at here is that if we have like if we have what seems like a stable category, um, whiteness, for example, right, and that term gets used or deployed in different ways that might change the nature of the term itself. So like the category might still exist, but what fits within or under that heading might shift depending on historical contingencies or contexts of use, right? Um, does that get your question? Okay. And we can, we'll have time to talk much more about all of this and I encourage pushback, et cetera. Um, So the critical questions that are raised by the socio-technical perspective um, to keep in mind is where do categories come from? How do they get repurposed from one context to another? What counts? Who gets counted? How does who gets counted, what gets counted, and what gets counted as what change over time? Who gets included and who gets excluded? What values are operative uh, through these categories? And how do differently positioned actors see things differently from one another? How might these categories appear different depending on where you sit within or as a subject to this classificatory system? Um, so just to kind of sum up before we move into uh, an exercise where we'll, we'll apply some of these lenses, um, the technical perspective um, causes us to ask what is being represented, what are trade-offs, what is being measured? Systems perspective, what are the system's goals? Who is included, excluded? Where are the feedback loops? Socio-technical perspective. How are categories constructed? Who is counting? What counts? What doesn't? What values are operative? Where do things get messy? And there's lots of, none of these lenses are seeing anything that is drastically different from the other thing. So that they're seeing the same thing in different ways. So there's a lot of overlap between them. And the things that these perspectives are looking at um, are determined by whether or not Microsoft thinks that it's time to update the operating system. Um, should we do it now? Should we restart now? <laughs> Raise your hand if we think we, uh, we should restart now. I'm going to try to snooze it. Um, yeah, so that's a, the, none, of the, none, of these, um, none of these are cleanly separated lenses, um, but they are different ways of shifting your perspective um, and different things come in and out of focus as you adopt these different perspectives. So it's a good way of looking at a problem from different angles and prompting different questions um, about different aspects of the system. All right, Christine's gonna introduce some case studies for us all. Cool. Uh, so us, I'm introducing case studies. Can I ask Trevor and Manny to start distributing the material? Um, so as Manny just introduced, we want to actually inspect a machine learning problem with three different perspectives, technical, system, and socio-technical. Um, just to put this practice a little bit into exercise, um, we have prepared three case studies, and we're going to try to divide the room into kind of a few subgroups. Every case study like, has a different context, but for every context, we listed three roles that you might play that might or might not reflect some of the perspectives that Manny just introduced. Um, as we're dividing the material, I'm gonna just quickly walk through the three contexts that uh, you, might inter you might encounter, and so that the room knows what like, another group is talking about. Cool. Uh, the first context is uh, race prediction from health record. So we're looking specifically for trying to predict uh, diabetes um, risk from a patient's um, lifestyle. So we know that diabetes has a strong indicator sometimes on genetics, but we also know that lifestyle might have a strong impact on kind of a patient's risk of devel developing diabetes in the future. So on the right, you see kind of there's a chart that doctors may give you. Um, you should exercise, walk more, eat more vegetables or vitamins or why not, and keep track of your weight. We want to investigate how we can actually take the, um, take the three perspectives into building a system that can predict diabetes risk from uh, lifestyle. So some of you might get that first um, exercise. The second one is a very, stand or a very classical computer vision problem. 
which is try to do land use survey from satellite images. So um, the task is pretty straightforward. On the top left, you see that there are satellite images that are captured by orbiting satellites. We have over 600 of them right now in orbit for both commercial and research purposes. That means every piece of land and water are pretty much being captured new images every five to 10 days. So the task is to go from a captured image to a segmentation map of different types of land use. And uh, the group will have the uh, opportunity to discuss how they will actually approach this task. Last but not least, we have facial recognition for travel and border control. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with, with facial recognition um, tasks. It's just about to, I mean, in this case, it's about to recognize a traveler and be able to recognize whether they should be granted entry into the country or whether they should be um, recognized as a threat. And with the goal of both kind of um, more being more accurate in predicting threats and also being able to speed up a normal traveler's experience. So I think um, almost every one of you will have a piece of paper in front of you. Uh, you have slightly more information on the context of the problem and you have, you'll be assigned a particular role in this uh, solution domain. And um, I think what we're gonna do is that, let's take just a couple of seconds or minutes to read through what's on the paper. And uh, um, what's the group layout right now? Okay. So I think this side of the room is dealing with the um, risk prediction uh, for diabetes. First part of that side of the room is uh, dealing with land use survey. And the second part of that part of the room, uh, the later half, is dealing with uh, travel and border control. So let's take a few minutes to read through kind of the rows and the prompts we may have. And uh, I encourage people to just form small groups around where you sit and discuss that uh, how you might approach this problem. Notice that you might have different perspectives. Um, what we're trying to come, what we're trying to see is how, if you are assigned a different role, that you might approach this problem differently. Yes, question. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you elaborate more? Uh, is there a comment from back on this? I think, yeah, that's definitely a good point. I think what we're trying to get is like, now you have this problem. We're not actually even conjecturing that a machine learning algorithm, a particular deep learning algorithm is best for this scenario. I think one of the questions we might want to answer or ask ourselves is like, is this problem suitable for a ML or automated system deployment? The conclusion may be some of them are not suitable or maybe all of them are not suitable, but how do we draw the line or where do we start? Or how do we start to approach that conclusion or come up with some kind of usable systems? So um, if everyone has had a chance to read the material, I encourage people maybe form some small groups around where you sit and talk about if you have been assigned different roles and how differently you might approach this problem. Okay, so can we have the groups wrap up your discussion? You can feel free to stay where you are and you don't have to move back to your chair and we're just gonna try to bring it back and have different groups share what they discussed. All right, uh, so which groups had the first scenario, which is predicting risk of diabetes based on data about lifestyle? Um, okay, group, there's a group here. Is there another group? 
Okay, we can just do it like this. It's another group that uh, had the diabetes risk prediction. Okay, over there. So um, does anyone from these two groups want to kind of discuss um, or can kind of share with the, the tutorial audience and what you discussed? Please. Um, we discussed a little bit about how uh, these case studies were bringing up how um, they wanted to use lifestyle as an additional signal beyond genetics. And I think our perspective was that like um, lifestyle on so many, so many different levels is, has like a drastically different baseline. So if you're looking at like what is considered like a healthy lifestyle in like Spain will be drastically different from like South Korea or the United States. And so um, I was perspective C and we were coming from the, like trying to draft a recommendation on behalf of the World Health Organization. And that almost seemed like it would be too broad to be useful. And if we wanted to do actually useful um, risk assessment for diabetes, we need to go at, look at it at a more granular, like fine tuned level. Anything else to add from that group? Or maybe some, oh, go ahead, please. So I had the perspective of the researcher who was building the model and there were questions about what kind of criteria do you need to build this algorithm from a patient's lifestyle. And uh, I would like to suggest that um, additional attributes be involved in the model or be involved in the way that the model is integrated into the clinical settings into which this model is being deployed to consider uh, the relationships between doctors and nurses and various professionals who grant uh, clinical care and think about how their epistemologies differ, how their cultural workloads differ, um, how patients within these clinical care settings are often treated very asymmetrically, especially women and people of color. And uh, so that I suggest that a model does not operate in a vacuum, but rather in a very complex socio-technical context. Great. Anything to add from this group or maybe the group behind? Um, we talked a little bit about the goal as stated in the, the sheet and how, so for those who haven't got this group, it says the goal of healthcare risk assessment algorithms is to identify future high cost patients based on past conditions and services. That is a goal. It doesn't have to be the goal. Um, if you are, uh, we thought it was interesting that the, the two of the case, the two of the um, roles were based in the US. The US healthcare system operates on quite different incentives from healthcare systems in other parts of the world. Um, and we thought there was maybe a little bit of a gap in the framework to think about what the stated goal of the system is and how that fits in. Um, so for example, it says, um, the, the idea is to identify high cost patients in order to allocate resources to those who may need them the most. Different healthcare providers are gonna have different opinions about who that is, even in a system of scarce resources, which is not necessarily the default. Um, and we also talked a little bit about how it was interesting that it, the example that was given was diabetes, which is quite a long term health condition. If you are a person who is at risk of sort of a diabetes related amputation, for example, this year, the interventions that you're going to need are very different from somebody 20 years from now. Um, so we talked quite a lot about the different incentives that exist for different people within the system that you've described, but also kind of other ways to think about it. Um, so we talked about, you know, if you're a researcher, what are your incentives? What are you being asked to deliver on? Are you the PI of a particular research project and you have to deliver on what your grant says? Or are you a PhD student who really needs to get a publication? Um, so, yeah, we talked a lot about that. What have I missed? So I think to, to, um, to just kind of conclude or like based on what everyone just said, I think what, we, uh, what this uh, case study one discuss is like how we define the algorithm or how we define the data and labels depends on perspectives of different, actually even groups of people. There's the patient. There's their kind of their cultural background, their nationality, even their profession. Some profession may be more pro uh, to diabetes, and then there's also kind of their 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 race to a certain extent, and uh, it also depends on the positionality or the perspectives of the person devel developing the system. Like 
couldn't be a researcher keen to get a publication, or is it someone at WHO level like wanting to have a recommendation for the world? And also, it depends on kind of if you're at WHO, kind of the social technical perspective, the problem is probably just even much harder because you want to aggregate research findings from different nations. There may be just various different. Um, vastly different cultural background uh, to to come up with that. So um, I think what we want to lead to is that maybe at some point, as this group discussed, when if you're at, at the WHO level, maybe it's not suitable to develop kind of international guideline on this, just because like the the perspectives from different countries are so different and application scenarios are so different. Potentially, you want kind of either region by region or even a much more fine grained recommendation. So. Cool. Um, in the sake, for the sake of time, uh, we want to still move on to group two and group three, but I just want to mention that we're actually at 1.30, so this tutorial is um, officially finished. If you need to go, feel free to leave. Uh, we're going to post all the slides and case studies on our website, which is linked to the uh, FAT conference website as well. Um, but if you have time to stick around, we're going to go to different, uh, the two different case studies and then uh, print, uh, bring up a few recommendations you already have. So. Um, so for, for the second case, which is um, the uh, land use survey, do people, do someone from the group want to share kind of what you discussed? Yeah, so we talked a lot about like the interaction between the different perspectives. We talked a lot about the uh, interactions that would happen between these different perspectives. We had people developing models for doing these uh, land use surveys, and we had people that were actually using these models and how to reconcile the differences between these use cases. So doing the development of these models was focused around someone in academia, those receiving funding, and if they had good results, they could get extensions on funding. And so we saw that this person would be trying to probably hit a high benchmark, have really high accuracy, and do something novel regardless of if novelty was needed because that they want to be able to publish as an academic where the person actually using it is somebody in industry that might not be aware of these goals. And so the way that they're situated in their personal life, their perspective on what they're trying to use these models for is going to change how the model's actually being used. And if they're not communicating these use cases, it's probably going to be ineffective in the long run. Great. I think that actually maps back to some of the slides that Manny was talking about earlier. So uh, from like around 1990s, all of feminist studies, a lot of kind of the conclusions like there's really not a, a objective way when scientists, when like researchers approach research questions, that we always as researchers bring our perspectives in how we frame the question, how we approach the the, the problem. So for people interested, I would encourage you to look up, look back up on Manny's uh, uh, references when we post the slides online. So. Any other, uh, any, any other people want to share um, your discussion from uh, the second case study on land use survey? All right, maybe we can move to the third one. Uh, seems to be. <laughs> um, yes, the third one is for face recognition system for travel and border control. And for other group, for people who are in other contests, you can see kind of the roles that they're asked to, uh, to assume in that case study on the, on the projector. Uh, I think uh, I got the perspective B, but uh, in our discussion, like we had uh, questions around, uh, like where to actually, like you know, start with uh, this kind of a data collection process and how to actually define, like, so one of the main benefits, uh, like the CBP is saying of this approach is that it gives us a reliable uh, identification of threat. Uh, as well as giving like a faster, like uh, easier access to the uh, people. So a faster can be uh, assumed because it's uh, like a automated solution, but like, you know, how do we actually define threat? And there we actually had a lot of discussion about uh, what kind of data are we collecting, especially if it's going to be just based on face, uh, like uh, the representative from ACLU suggested that how are people who are identified, they are going to be treated if they are falsely flagged and uh, uh, then the machine learning people wanted to know, like, you know, how do we actually measure which is like the, the right definition of threat, or what are the different levels of threat? Uh, threat. So I think uh, there were a lot of discussion around that, and uh, I, I feel like you know this problem in that perspective is still like need to be very specifically defined, and uh, uh, how how does it like uh, it needs to be measured, like you know how it how replacing a normal like uh, current TSA agent uh, will be compared to like you know just replacing it by say uh, like a machine learning algorithm. Hmm. 
Any other point to share from that group? Maybe my teammates will add to this, but we had a discussion on this whole question of where do you start. And so one of the things, I'm, I know maybe I'm taking a personal perspective <laughs> C, but I'm perspective A. Um, and one thing that I would bring up is who's hired in this company as the beginning point. So we see a lot of baked in biases. We're acknowledging these in, in hiring processes. So maybe that would be something that I would do if it was my company to make sure that it is representative before we start digging deep into the actual goals. Um, does anybody else? Uh, thanks for sharing. On that note, I encourage you to stay in the same room because here's the next tutorial on how organizational structure <laughs> impacts AI ethics and fairness studies. Um, cool. So I think from um, from like the the third case is probably the, the hardest because there has been a lot of debate on whether this should actually be marked as an AI no go area, which is all of like municipalities and cities around the world trying to ban face recognition. But I think all of you have brought out good points. It's like I think the, the key to it is like who is gonna who is the system gonna benefit and who's gonna system gonna like disproportionately harm. And if it turns out in deployment this has like severe or harmful consequence for, for certain people, we might need to reconsider to relay back. So that brings us to uh, the final two slides for this tutorial. Um, we have some recommendations uh, for you. Um, so uh, the initial one is going to wrap up on what Trevor discussed uh, based on data set creation and reuse. Uh, this is definitely not comprehensive, but just some specific takeaways for me, and then hopefully you have uh, additional ones. So these are just things to look for if you're doing machine learning. For one of several of your non-miscellaneous categories blow up in size. So for example, when we saw that directed negative or directed incivility was being lumped together with regular incivility in a lot of other studies, that was an issue uh, that we tried to investigate. Um, if any categories are empty or un, uh, unrepresented, or if they're being uncategorized or unlabeled at all, that's a problem too. So for example, from journalists, we learned that you poor little thing, which was getting no signal from any of the leading machine learning algorithms for this kind of thing, uh, was very, it was effective uh, as a tactic against journalists in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, if any categories are repurposed or change meaning, maybe reinvestigate them. In terms of stakeholders, um, I think one of the keys is to involve the people affected by the problem in the deliberative process, and, and they should get a say in how things are decided. And in my experience, working in interdisciplinary teams is great. So we have um, people in communications and um, journalism backgrounds on our team uh, leading it, which helps draw on networks and get new perspectives to the table. And perhaps if you can't build meaningful consensus or if the people affected by the problem really don't like what you're showing them, maybe it should just be a no-go area, and that's that's really a good thing to be able to say. Do you want to do that? And this slide has a few more kind of more practical recommendations. And again, this is by no way, uh, by no means um, conclusive or like exhaustive, but uh, a few things that we think uh, can benefit. This is like the first one is we want to start documenting these key decisions on how label and data is collected more in the data set release notes. Um, there has been several framework being proposed for that, but uh, we feel like we need more documentation on specific how classification systems came to be and how what whether there were deliberations when that went into the way when we created that. And the second one is uh, related to deployment. Uh, we do want to examine feedback with a perspective, with the three perspectives that we just introduced. And if we at any moment see that the context misalignment is severe or harmful, we should consider rolling it back. And last but not the least, uh, we have talked about, for example, in the census example that what worked five years ago or 10 years ago might no longer be applicable. I think that has not been a practice that machine learning community has adopted. But how, how about, but like, what if we can set an expiration date every time we release a data set or a label map to say that this, we expect this to be valid for five years. After five years, we either revisit, update, or deprecate the data set. So I think these are some, we think these are some of the practical recommendations we can all take in heart in the, as we go to um, our, as we go develop our applications. And uh, if any of you has more ideas and want to share kind of your thoughts on what we can do about it, we'll be around after this talk. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to come up. Again, the uh, slides and the case studies will all be posted online to the website. 
And with this, we thank you for attending this tutorial and wish you a happy Fast Star Conference.